If you please turn with me into your Bibles, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. We are looking at a series of messages. Believers, beware. The Lord gives some warnings, and there's great application for us today that we can heed what God's Word says. So we're going to be looking today in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, beginning at verse 13 through 21. And this message is focusing on beware of greed. First of all, there was a dispute. The Bible says in verse 13, someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. So the request is, Lord, tell my brother here to divide what is the inheritance. Now, what does Jesus know? He knows everything. He knows their hearts. He knows what's going on. He knows the complete story. Amen? And so, what Jesus answers in verse 14, he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? In a sense, he is saying here, I'm not going to go away from the spiritual aspect of what I'm teaching to deal with this temporal matter. It fails in comparison to the worth of the very teaching. He had been teaching about the Holy Spirit. In verse 10, he was talking about everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. And then he talks about as the disciples would be carried forth or different ones being persecuted. And that in their defense, he said, the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So he's been focusing on what the Holy Spirit, what he's going to be doing, and how he's going to be teaching and how he's working. And he wasn't going to get off onto this. This was a man's concern. When we see the Lord's caution, the Bible says in verse 15, Jesus said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. His life doesn't consist of his possessions. When there was somebody very wealthy that died, and the question was asked, how much did that person leave? And the correct answer was, he left it all. He left it all. You know, um, I remember going... Uh, we have a, a funeral home really close to where we live in Newark. And I remember going by that funeral home one day and seeing a large moving truck. And there was a procession. And uh, instead of having the hearse, the casket was going to the cemetery in this large moving storage, uh, uh, moving truck. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And I saw somebody from that funeral home. And so I asked him, I said, why, why was there the, the moving and storage truck here? And, and the, they were lined up for the procession. Well, I should have known this. Ivan Mathis that owned Mathis Moving and Storage had went to be with the Lord. And so they decided to take him to the cemetery in one of the trucks. And so that was the only time I've ever seen a moving and storage truck that would be taking. But it was taking Ivan, who loved the Lord, and, and was going on to be with him, doing well. But, you know, that day, but the idea is, the Lord says, don't get caught up. 
with the temporal, the material. And you know, it's just like that one song says, we're just passing through. Don't get too comfortable here. This is temporary, isn't it? You know, it's, it boggles the mind when we sing. When we've been there 10,000 years, it's just as if we just begun to sing the praises in worshiping our Lord and Savior. No wonder the Bible compares this life here just as a vapor. Temporary. What's a hundred years in comparison of eternity? When we think about what Jesus is saying, be careful, beware the greed. It's a form of idolatry. It is when the material takes priority over the spiritual. I love when Paul writes to the believers in Colossae, in Colossians 3, as he would say, positionally, you are seated, you are in Christ in the heavenly places. Set your mind, your affection, set your mind on things above where Christ is, not on the temporary. Set your mind on things above, the spiritual, the eternal, that which lasts. The Amplified Bible has with Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says, let your character or moral dip disposition be free from love of money, including greed, avarice, lust, and craving for earthly possessions, and be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. That word contentment or satisfaction For he, God himself, has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down. Relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. I'm not going to leave you, nor forsake you. I'm not going to let go of my hold, my care for you. And verse 6, so we take comfort and are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do to me? That leads to a dilemma. Jesus is going to tell a parable. An earthly story that has such a powerful meaning. And it's a story that they are all going to grasp. Jesus says, the land of a rich man was very productive. He had a fruitful business, a successful farmer, a successful farmer who is planting the seed and is going to reap way more than what's planted. That's the desire of any farmer, isn't it? As the seed is put in the ground, and when it's time to harvest, it was successful. That's not the problem. The problem isn't that there was a great harvest. The problem wasn't that the land was productive, that there was a fruitful business. But in verse 17, he actually became a fretful farmer. He began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? His farming business has been so successful there is no longer any spot, any place to store his crops. Boy, that's a good problem to have, isn't it? 
The Lord has blessed abundantly, but the problem is he doesn't give any single thought at all to the Lord. Everything is based upon his own life, his own life, his own disease. Everything's about him. Self. You know what? Greed can show up in any income level. It doesn't have to be the wealthy. Any income level can be guilty of greed. Because the Bible says, be content with such things as you have. I remember years ago reading a survey, and they said the average person, the average worker said, I'll be satisfied with $7,000 more a year. How many here think they would be satisfied with $7,000 more? That was the answer they gave. If I just made $7,000 more a year, I'll be okay. I'll be happy. No. The Bible is the challenge. Be content with such things as you have. But here is this farmer. He has the problem now is, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. But notice, as I read verses 17 through 19, listen to the pronouns. He began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The Bible is not condemning here savings. The Bible is not condemning a retirement account. The Bible is not condemning any of those things. In fact, in Proverbs, the ants are used as an example of storing up, aren't they? So it's not a matter of the Lord saying saving is wrong and this and this. But here's the issue. In these verses, the personal pronoun is used 11 times. Either I or my. The whole focus is on me. I read about a tea party that was given. And the only one attended was me, myself, and I. And, boy, those guests enjoyed it, me, myself, and I. But what's missing here is the Lord. There's no thought of the Lord. He gave no thought that God was the owner of all things, and he was a steward. That's an important word. He was a steward of all things that God had given them. We're reminded, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All belong to him. We might like something and, and say, that's mine. <laughs> Who gave you the strength to work for it? Who provided the finances to pay for it? And the reality is, if you've got a mortgage on that, <laughs> the bank might argue that it's yours. They'll say, that belongs to us. But the Lord is the owner of the earth, is the Lord, the fullness thereof. And you know what? One of the best, the most known, one of the most known stewards in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, was the man Joseph. Remember, he was sold as a slave to an officer of Pharaoh, Potiphar was his name, and Potiphar had many possessions, and Joseph managed those possessions, and Potiphar said, the Lord is hit with him, and the Lord blesses everything that he's involved with. And so Potiphar had noticed Joseph and said, I'm just going to allow him to manage all of the things that I possess. 
Now, it was a lot of things, wasn't it? But how much of that belonged to Joseph? He was the steward. You know, stewardship is a, a, quite a word because we're accountable. Stewards and managers give an account for what they are stewarding. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4, it is needed as a requirement for stewards to be faithful, to be found faithful. I believe that God gives us a lot of stewardships, not just finances. What about relationships? The people that live around you, that's not by accident. The people that you have relationships with, those aren't accidents. That we have a responsibility as children of God to influence other people spiritually. To influence them. Our testimony should be so that a neighbor that is going through a difficult time says, please pray for me. That they know that you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you are walking with him. And you have a testimony. Or the person at work that says, I'm going through a very tough time. I need prayer. And they come to you. Why? Because they've seen evidence that you love the Lord Jesus Christ and that you're walking with him. That's a stewardship. Time is a stewardship. Paul says, redeem the time, make the most of every opportunity. Why? Understand what the will of the Lord is. I hate to hear when people say, I'm just killing time. I'm like, oh, <laughs> don't you wish you could barter time like you, you could share money and give money? It's like, oh, give me some of that time that you're not wanting. I'll take it. We can't do that. But we manage, don't we? And the reality is we give an account of that to Almighty God. He's the owner of it all. Amen? Did this man understand that? No. Who do you address? This is interesting in this parable. The Bible says, he said, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Pastor Paul Chappell in his book, Luke, Journey with Jesus, wrote about this, that this man serves as an example of four indications of self-willed financial planning, self-will. He asked, what shall I do? He never said, what would the Lord have me to do? Never looks to him. Self-exaltation. He gave no thanks to God. Thank you, Lord, for the bountiful harvest that you've given. Thank you for all that you have provided. No. Self-trust. He made the statement, this is what I will do. So, you have many goods laid up for many years. So now, just take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Boy, that sounds a lot like what Solomon wrote about in Ecclesiastes of life under the sun, isn't it? Vanity of vanity. All is vanity. Meaningless. Worthless. Under the sun is apart from yielded to Almighty God. That is man's idea. And he says, oh, this is the plan. This is what will happen. Self-sufficiency. He says, I'll tear down my current barns and build larger ones. And that's where I'm going to store all my grain. I don't need the Lord. I'm doing quite well. My barns are full. You know, there's always the spiritual dangers of prosperity. We love prosperity. We love it when things are going well. We love it when we're in great health. We love it when finances are going well, the family's doing well. We love that, don't we?
But remember the early book, the early chapters of the book of Acts? The early Jerusalem church? Did they face adversity? Yeah. In fact, I think it's because of what the Lord said, even in the warning in Deuteronomy 8 to the children of Israel, you're going into the promised land. You're going into a land of plenty, the land of milk and wine, and, and there's going to be all these things. And he gave them a warning. He says, you're going to forget me. In the midst of prosperity, you're going to forget me. Now in the wilderness, what were they dependent upon? Every day, God sending that manna that they would go and collect. But they didn't need manna once they went into the promised land. But he said, here's the danger. In the midst of prosperity, that you have all these things, you will forget me. And what happens? They turned their hearts away from the Lord. They said, look at what we've accomplished. Look what we have done. So we see the dilemma. Now we have a real danger. Verses 20 and 21. In this parable that Jesus tells about the rich man, what's he forget to do? He forgot to plan for eternity. He made his plans, didn't he? My barns are full so I can take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But what about eternity? His mind wasn't, his focus wasn't set upon heaven. His focus wasn't set upon the Lord. His focus was set upon the here and now and enjoying everything here. He never gave thought to the Lord. I can't remember if it was Moody or who rightly said, you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. To know where I'm going to spend eternity. Isn't that the most important matter in any, anybody's life? Like I said earlier, even somebody lived to be 100 years of age here, what is that in light of eternity? It's just called a, a mist. It's a vapor. It's here. It's gone. He forgot to plan for eternity. Look at this in verse 20. But God said to him, you fool. Now in Psalm 14, 1, we're told the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There is, I believe, is italicized. So it would rightly be saying no God. It is like one living as if there's no God. Is that the way this man's living? He hasn't given any thought at all toward God. This is all my plans. This is what I'm going to do. This is what the comforts I have. This is the decisions I'm making. It's my life. Oh, but what happens when he hears the word, you fool? The one who has lived as if God does not exist. There are a lot more practical atheists than there probably would be even intellectually or whatever. Though the practical atheist is one that lives as if there is no God. That they might say, well, I believe there's God out there, but they don't give any thought to eternity or any thought toward God. He forgot about God. So the Lord says he's a fool. You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? You're worried about all your barns and all your storage and all the, the blessings, that all these things... But your soul is required of you this night. He was so wrapped up in his possessions and planned for ease that he gave no thought to eternity. Hebrews 9.27, remember where it says it is appointed unto men to die once, then comes the judgment. 
it's appointed. And he failed to give any thought at all toward eternity. Dr. Daryl Bach, a professor at Dallas Seminary, made the statement, God demands an account of the man's mortal soul, and his grain and wealth cannot pay his debt. All that grain, all his wealth, can't mean a thing toward eternity, can it? We were singing that wonderful song, Victory in Jesus. I know I have a home in heaven. Why? Because Jesus Christ went to the cross. He paid the sin debt with his own precious blood that believing in him, I have that assurance. But what about this man? The Lord says, you fool. In verse 21, he forgot to invest for eternity. So Jesus says, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He stored up all these things here, but he wasn't rich toward God. God never crossed his thoughts. He didn't plan for eternity. He didn't invest in eternity. Here just recently, we've heard about some bank failures, haven't we? We've heard about the danger of runs on the banks and people taking their money out. Even around the world, there's been major banks and major sized banks that they say, oh, we're nervous about what's going to happen. Aren't you thankful? that you can invest in eternity and be rich toward God and don't have to worry about a failure? <laughs> There's no bank failures in heaven, amen? It's the constant reminder that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He is the owner of it all. I am a steward. And I need to heed the scriptures that says, be content with such things as you have. Why? Because I will never leave you nor forsake you. Then you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. He never fails. There's a lot of systems on this earth that can fail. I was trying to order the Vacation Bible School starter kit for some time, and guess what? Couldn't order it. Called the number? I'm sorry, our network is down. And for several days, that network was down. And you know what? It was a failure, wasn't it? I imagine that was a lot of money being lost because you couldn't order anything. <laughs> you, you couldn't talk. They, they had a recording. They didn't have somebody answering the phone and saying, hey, there was a failure. I was relieved when the, it was back up. But things fail here on this earth. Listen to this as Jesus says in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When we think about being rich toward the Lord and storing up treasures in heaven, the reality is man remembers self, but man should remember Almighty God. The Bible teacher Randy Alcorn stated, when you leave this world, will you be known as one who accumulated treasures on earth that you couldn't keep? Or will you be recognized as one who invested treasures in heaven that you couldn't lose? To be setting your mind on things above where Christ is, the, the eternal. 
Does it make differences when you support the ministries where people are being saved? Lives are being changed. When people are coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, as we would be faithful to the Lord and sending on ahead. I want to hear those glorious, well, those glorious words, well done. Good and faithful servant. How about you? Well done. The Lord gives a reminder. It's a warning. Beware of greed. Beware of greed. And, and truly, scripturally, it is a form of idolatry. It's placing the importance of the temporal, the material, over the spiritual. And every one of us have to guard against it. Amen? I don't care your income level. A lot of times people say, oh, that's just for the wealthy. No, that's not what the Bible says. It's for any of us to beware of greed. But think about eternity. As we prepare for the invitation, would you bow your heads, please? In Jesus' parable, this rich man, this rich farmer, he based everything on having the barns full and his whole plan of taking ease and, and just taking it easy in life. But then the Lord says, fool, your soul is required of you. Not in the future, now. But what did he fail to do? Give any thought to eternity. Maybe you're here today, and in your life you've been very busy. Maybe your focus has been just wrapped up on right now. I just invite you in this time of invitation. You know, you can be ready for eternity. You can know, the Bible says you can know, you can have assurance of your salvation. You can know that you're saved. And that's glorious, friend. Do you know if you were told that this was your last day on this earth? Do you know where you'd spend eternity? If your answer is, I hope heaven, or I think heaven, the Bible says that you can know that you have heaven as your home. We can't get there by our own works, our own efforts. It's not by religious activities. It's only by placing your trust in Jesus Christ alone. The Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, myself and every one of us. We've missed the mark of God's perfection. We can't get to heaven on our own, on our, the basis of our own good deeds. That's why the Bible says, and even in Romans 6, 23, for the wages, what we've earned, the wages of sin is death. But the gift, what we cannot earn is what God gives. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So how is it possible for me, a guilty sinner, to be able to go to heaven Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. Now, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Friend, he died for you. He took your sins upon himself. He was buried, but he rose again the third day. You have to place your trust in him. I heard a preacher say recently, the answer about going to heaven. How, how can I know I go to heaven? Because that man on the middle cross said I could come. Jesus Christ. He's the only way. Right now, maybe there's a tugging at your heart. Friend, the Holy Spirit, he convicts. That means causing you to see. Maybe there's somebody here just with raised hands says, Pastor, I'm just raising my hand. Please pray for me because I don't have the answer that, yes, I know that I have a home in heaven, that I would go to, to heaven if I were to die even this day. But I want that assurance today. And there's a tugging in my heart. I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but you can just put your hand, down, uh, hand up and then I'll put it back down. And just let me see it. Say, so that's me. There's a tug in my heart that I, I don't have that assurance that I know I would spend eternity with the Lord, that I would go to heaven. Maybe there's here as a believer, somebody that says, you know, the Lord has spoken in my heart because I'm really getting caught up with the comforts of this life. And really I've become so focused on here that I've not really been focused on eternity. And saying my thing, in my mind, my affection on things above where Christ is. And the Holy Spirit has spoken to me today about that. He said, just pastor, please pray for me because the Lord's been speaking to my heart about this. Just with raised hand and you put it back down. God bless you. Heavenly Father, we pray as we have this invitation, Lord. We ask as the Holy Spirit as would speak to hearts that we would have a boldness if there's somebody here that's not sure of their salvation, that even this day from your word they can know. I pray for the believer that may be struggling, Lord, and I pray that you would speak to their heart. May they respond to you right now. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand?